Hi, I'm Sam Wells. Welcome to today's presentation by Pope Bama. They will be discussing their technical setup. And make sure to, to stay tuned for the concert for tonight, which is at 7.30 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time. Pope Bama is a New York-based experimental duo that focuses on exciting performances of unconventional works. Described as noisily virtuosic, Aaron Rodgers and Dennis Sullivan are composer performers who apply text, electronics, high energy instrumental writing to freshly squeezed sounds. So please enjoy this presentation by Pope Bama. Hi everyone. Hey everybody. We're Pope Bama and uh, we're thrilled to be part of uh, Splice Festival 2021. I'm Aaron Rogers, I'm the saxophonist uh, and uh, composer, electronician, uh, vocalist uh, for Pope Palma. And I'm Dennis Sullivan. I'm a percussionist and composer, uh, sometimes vocalist, and um, work with uh, electronics. And this is our third public presentation as part of Splice this week. Uh, we had a concert on Monday night that featured a number of performances that we uh, performed, videoed, and, and created really for Splice. Um, on Tuesday, we explained uh, a piece by me that we had performed on Monday alongside a piece that we wrote together. And I led that discussion on Tuesday for the presentation. And today we're going to focus on a piece that was not on the Monday concert, but that is a real important part of our repertoire. And that's written by Dennis Sullivan. So um, the first thing we're going to do is play the performance of this piece. And then Dennis is going to break down uh, a lot of the electronics used in the piece, sort of demystify and, uh, and make it clear what was going on. So check out the video. We're, go we're about to play it, and then, uh, and then we'll talk about it. And a quick note, uh, just to have a very brief rundown of uh, what you're going to see. Um, Gamma Chamber was written uh, actually for uh, the Splice Festival about four years ago and has been revised uh, multiple times since then, and this is the kind of culmination of those four years of revisions. Um, you'll see uh, various, um, a whole system of transducers uh, producing feedback loops um, on placed on various instruments and resonant membranes. Uh, there's some fixed media, there's live processing of percussion, live processing of the fixed media, live processing of the saxophone, and um, yeah, a couple other goodies that we'll get into when we when we look under the hood here. Uh, but the piece is about 14 minutes long, and so I uh, hope you enjoy. Um, this is a pseudo world premiere of this video of uh, Gamma Chamber.
Okay, so uh, hope you enjoyed the piece. Um, if you have been uh, present for um, some of the other workshops and performances that we've done, uh, Pope Amma's done for Splice this week, you're probably starting to um, get the impression that we really do love uh, feedback in all forms. <laughs> um, and it's really a prominent uh, part of our work. Um, so when I um, sat down to write Gamma Chamber um, four years ago, initially, when, it, when we first started this process, um, I really wanted to explore the idea of a uh, dual role of instrumentalist and sound engineer, um, taking the idea of being behind the mixing board and, and being a, an audio engineer and uh, adding that performative element to it. You know, I, it, it, at this point, we have all this music and repertoire now, not just for Pope Bama, but for you know, a lot of um, contemporary music ensembles and improvising ensembles where the uh, the person behind the board is just as much a part of the ensemble even in their, in their even if they're in the back of house uh, a lot of times they're reading a score and like their their part is might as well be notated um, so I was interested in bringing that role onto the stage and kind of developing a multitasking uh, kind of uh, instrumentalist sound engineer person um, but it's really it's it's engineer as instrumentalist as opposed to instrumentalist as engineer 
And what I mean by that is the mixing console is really written for as an instrument as opposed to like a, a logistics machine or something for you know EQing balance and whatnot. So all of these um, actions and and possibilities that a, a mixing board is capable of, um, and really just some base you know in this case it's very basic functions of mute buttons on and off, um, faders volume faders uh, for dynamic curves, and um, the EQ really acting as a um, kind of like a timbral sculpting device, a real-time timbral sculpting device. Um, so all of those things are happening at the percussion station and saxophone station throughout um, throughout the piece. Um, so much of my um, electronic work to that point, and still today, um, deals with heavily processed um, live samples, so making sure that there's always kind of this um, very obvious connection between the processed sounds and the instrumental sounds on stage. Um, and that is deployed via um, modular synth racks, um, too many guitar pedals to count, <laughs> um, uh, audio plugins, um, and it's, it's really mostly done um, in, in hardware uh, with, with Pope Bama. And for, at least for my composition, that usually led to a lot of fixed media parts, a lot of tape parts. Um, but at this time, uh, kind of going back to what we were talking about yesterday on the panel, um, and something that I feel has kind of been a theme for Splice this week, um, was trying to, to address this idea of aliveness and nowness to electronic music, and showing that there are um, actions and reactions to what the performer is doing on stage that is producing all of that sound that comes from a small transducer on the stage, or comes from the speakers hung above your head, or even just comes through your laptop speakers, comes through your earbuds, comes through your over ears. Um, but to make sure that there's always something um, that that there's an action that is very mappable to the sound. Um, and so, as opposed to a tape part, um, when I first wrote the piece, I decided that I wanted to trigger those samples myself, um, and I wanted it to be something that was visible and not like a, a foot pedal on the floor, not a single uh, pedal that went through a bulleted list and not um, kind of a series of pedals on the floor, but to trigger the samples in a way that the audience could see. Um, much like uh, Aaron I's piece Showdown, which we showed at our last presentation and was part of uh, the concert on Monday, where we had the physical action of you know putting the fist down on the uh, soft step pedal to trigger samples on and off. And so I initially, originally started this uh, process by loading all of these fixed media sounds up into a mallet cat, which uh, for those of you that don't know, it's a uh, MIDI trigger that is set up like for a percussionist as a mallet instrument. So what I had was a three octave mallet cat, just um, rub, you know rubber like neoprene pads um, that act as, as MIDI triggers. Um, and I essentially set all the samples up in order of the piece that they would occur in chromatic order. Um, so just essentially playing in a, a chromatic scale. And so because it was essentially just creating a uh, playing a chromatic scale, uh, that's actually why I abandoned it. Uh, the Mallet Cat was not in that performance. Um, and this was the biggest revision to the piece, um, is I just decided that the, the Mallet Cat was just, when I went back and saw the video, um, it was just not an exciting thing to watch me play. <laughs> um, I think maybe if I was playing licks around the instrument and really actually like engaging, but this kind of one shot, hit the C, let the sample play through. Next, C sharp, let the sample play through. D, let the sample play through. Um, it, it, it was, I thought that maybe I it would make my role more involved in the production of the electronic sound, but actually it wound up being that I wound up, because there were so many samples, um, over 150, uh, I wound up being so consumed by triggering this sample, these samples, uh, that that was most of what I did in the piece. Either I had uh, a snare drum and some bowed styrofoam and the dowel rods, which we'll talk about, but for the most part, um, I was glued to this mallet cat, and I realized that, like, well, I'm trying to create a situation of electronic aliveness and nowness and put intention by these sounds and make for an exciting uh, performance for the listener. But really, I was playing a 14-minute chromatic scale, <laughs> which I decided um, that is not nearly as interesting as I thought it might be. So I, I totally um, abandoned that. Um, and so the solution was... All of those samples went into a tape part, went into a fixed media part. 
Um, and then I actually fleshed that out quite a bit more, added a lot of uh, a lot more detail to them um, because I knew I was going to be able to press play and they would just happen. Um, I do want to mention you heard you might have heard in the beginning of the piece kind of a guttural, gritty, screaming voice at time. Uh, that is the voice of um, Doug Moore, who is a really wonderful um, vocalist, uh, leader of the lead vocalist of the technical death metal avant death metal group Piron also of a group Sepidus and Glorious Depravity, all three worth checking out, um, amazing instrumentalists, and Doug is a, an amazing vocalist who has now started collaborating in the new music world with us, which is uh, a godsend, really great. Um, so anyway, um, I, ma I made the decision that, you know, to move these samples to the tape part and that the engagement with the mixer, the engagement with the transducer feedback stations, and the engagement with the guitar pedals that were on the floor provided plenty of aliveness and awareness and nowness to the electronics um, that I felt like it did map that we were intentionally making these actions. Um, Aaron, we're going to show this later, but Aaron has a transducer affixed to the end of her soprano saxophone, and we'll show you just how that is stuck on there here in a little bit. Um, I added another feedback transducer to um, the percussion part, which is mounted on the back of a piece of sheet metal or a thunder sheet with an SM57 for some proximity. Um, and those go through the same uh, mixer and through the same loop, so they kind of wind up interfering with each other, sometimes even canceling each other out as they did at the end of the piece uh, there. And so I you know, I also made this choice to add just more percussion, the bass drum, the large bass drum, the tam-tam, all of these things, um, and, and just add to the, to the live processing of those. Um, so I'd like to take a, an under the hood look here at the uh, signal flow at the path of the mixer. Um, so we have a video here that we're going to share. Um, that kind of is from the day of the recording session of the video you just saw. Um, and it'll pass through and we'll see the mixer. And I'll kind of walk you through the, um, the routing of the mixer here. go. So we're moving around and we're going to pause right there. And so you can see um, in the uh, the first channel, the far left channel, you have uh, the saxophone mic. Uh, the next channel over you have the percussion mic. Um, Aaron, is it possible to make the video a little bit bigger on our screen? Thank you so much. Um, so we have saxophone mic, percussion mic, um, the third channel over, you'll see, has the little yellow piece of tape around the XLR plug. Um, that is actually a, um, I'll, show, I'll show you this in a second, a uh, telephone pickup, a uh, coil pickup. So basically just an iron slug with uh, copper wire wrapped around it, as you would find in a guitar pickup or a humbucker. Um, that amplifies electromagnetic fields and picks up electromagnetic data in the room. Um, and that was affixed to a um, fluorescent uh, spotlight. That was, you might have seen a light shining in and out of Aaron's bell at the beginning of the piece. Um, the current of that light as it was um, as it was turned on and off was, was being amplified. Um, next over, you have two uh, aux sends, auxiliary channels, um, and both of those feed to the processing signals. Um, so the first one, you have a Boss DD6, which we talked about the other day, we'll talk more about today and a massive possessed pedal, which is essentially a granular synthesis pedal, and the other aux channel um, over from that. So now we're talking one, two, three, four, the fifth channel over is a um, Boss OC3, just an octave shifter, and that is actually feeding to the uh, telephone coil pickup. So the um, hum of that electric light, of that fluorescent spotlight, was be being uh, shifted down two octaves at times. The Boss DD6 and the OC3 um, or sorry, the Boss DD6 and the Massive Possessed Pedal are feeding to the um, percussion mic, to the sax mic, and to the um, the tape part also. And so the tape channel is the next one over, and that last little yellow cable is uh, uh, coming out of a preamp that is attached to a couple of contact microphones that were uh, amplifying those long dowel rods that you may have seen clamped to the sides of the table and that caused, I bowed those dowel rods kind of causing a bit of a seesaw 
Um, to the left of it, we're going to show you this uh, live and in person, but to the left of it is the um, transducer mixer that was producing the feedback in the transducers, and uh, directly above that is a uh, fuzz pedal uh, that was distorting and also feeding back into itself, causing another level of interference um, within the feedback. So we're going to move the video along here, show you the rest of the setup from, from my point of view, from my perspective, and we will pause right there. And there's Aaron and Zach getting the sounds dialed in. You see the upside down snare drum there with a block of styrofoam. Uh, the snares are engaged with the fingernails and then that socket wrench that produces a series of clicks. Um, the reason for mounting it on the snare drum was the idea of creating another resonant surface. We have overhead PA speakers producing all the electronic sounds and I thought of those vibrating bodies and those vibrating speaker cones and then the transducer vibrating in Aaron, the bell of Aaron's saxophone, the transducer vibrating on the uh, thunder sheet. I wanted to kind of make a point of all the uh, sounds were vibrating within some other kind of acoustic resonator. So the styrofoam and the ratchet resonate in that snare drum, producing another, activating the snares and kind of producing another layer of um, kind of sympathetic resonance from one object to another. And we'll move the video along here. Yeah. Here we are getting all the sounds. There is the thunder sheet with the mic hanging. Pause right here. And you'll see um, there's the Boss DD6, the white with the blue, um, kind of in the middle. And then on the other side of the snare drum leg, the massive possessed pedal. And uh, to the right, the black volume pedal is actually for uh, kind of an on and off trigger of the transducers, otherwise they'd be feedbacking for the entire piece. <laughs> and to the right of that, uh, the Boss OC3 that is going through the telephone coil pickup. And that's it for that video. That get, kind of gives you an inside look at our um, at the battle station, so to speak. And I want to demonstrate here, and I'll use our little mobile cam. And Aaron, if you could open up channel 2 for me, please. Um, this is the telephone coil pickup. Um, so we have a certain lot of copper wire wrapped around an iron slug there. And you can see, as I get closer to the phone, so there, I have, the, I have it on the face of the phone. And there's that electromagnetic field. So that is, you can put this on anything. That cruise, I believe, uh, there's a really great book, and the name of the author is escaping me, but there's a uh, wonderful book where they refer to this as circuit sniffing. So that is the effect on the, and we can close out channel two if you don't mind. Um, and and we, uh, so this is the, uh, what is picking up the uh, hum of the light, um, of the, the fluorescent light. Um, so, a big part of um, my my electronic work is um, I've, I've fallen in love with this Boss DD6 pedal, and I, we talked a little bit about it. Um, this idea of the um, it's a looper and it's got a loop function, but only a seven second buffer. Uh, so it's not really something that you create a long phrase sample and then layer over top of it and build something cumulative over time. Um, because it's such a small buffer size, I find that it has a little bit more of a, uh, let's call it lilting-like quality to it. Um, and what I really enjoy about the pedal is it's, um, because you can quickly access, press, record, off, playback, and then press down to keep overdubbing, um, it really, um, the effectiveness of the pedal is all about what you feed it. Um, so there can be all sorts of, you know, uh, sounds happening at once and you wind up with this kind of like multi-layered cake that is like a sum of its parts and to show you an example of what that might sound like um, I'll feed a little bit of the tape part into the the DD6 here so you can hear that and there that is coming back and let's put a little bit of styrofoam on it symbol. And then I use this 
this this granular synth pedal to kind of just take. You can very clearly um, hear all of these. Take this down for now. You can really hear the three different layers. And then what I like about putting it through a, something like a granular synthesis, synthesis patch or pedal is it completely, completely like disorients those layers, right? Where you can't really hear a base, a middle, and a top layer, and they just kind of all get scrambled, and your orientation is kind of thrown all over the place, which is something I deploy quite a bit in Gamma Chamber. <laughs> So um, this is, uh, I believe uh, Eleni Lilios was asking us about this question of, of permanence of gear and, and Aaron and I were talking the other day about this idea that like our gear will sometimes like our pieces will date themselves. Like they'll be, we'll realize like, oh man, that was 2017 because that's the year that the DD6 made it into everything. Um, and this has still become like a, a, a big part of our practice um, this pedal and another thing that I really enjoy about it and just to talk a little bit more about the idea of looping because I think sometimes we hear the term looping and it can, it can sometimes get a little bit of a bad rap um, something I really love about um, particularly the DD6 and this kind of looping is you can get up to seven seconds but you can kind of get down to like the nanosecond as well um, and so to me I I think of it as two different kinds of looping uh, glitched looping and phrase looping and I just I'm making those things up but that's what it is to me um, the glitched looping is to capture a nanosecond of a sound and have it repeat and come back to you um, in you know a very quick kind of repetitive fashion so we can go yeah oh. And even just a nice staccato attack. And you really kind of have to learn to finesse the trigger on this pedal quite a bit. Um, the other nice thing about that is because you can overdub it and you're overdubbing over a, such a small section, you can get to a place of pretty harsh aggressive noise very quickly. And so on and so forth. Hopefully that wasn't too painful. Um, and the other is what we would call like phrase looping. And phrase looping is um, something where I imagine it's got a much more lilting kind of quality. And I always describe it as that you can hear where the seam is. And by seam, I mean you can hear where it hits its end and comes back around at the beginning. Like if you were to do a tape loop or a splice, you can hear where that, where that cut or where that incision was made and they were spliced together. So for example, So this is what you were hearing at the end of the piece uh, with the transducers on the saxophone and the transducer on the thunder sheet um, being put into the DD6 and we kind of, you just kind of get this like lilting motif um, that's kind of, you know, becomes this kind of like magical hypnotic space. Um, this is also a technique that Aaron so expertly included in uh, Light on Light with, uh, actually with this exact symbol. Um, yeah, so we're going to move on, move on to the transducer now. And uh, I'm going to have Aaron take it away here and show off her saxophone and the transducer setup and talk a little bit about the routing of that. All right, yeah, so... I'm sure you saw in the video of uh, Gamma that this became quite a uh, baton. It was not just played, but it was also moved around a lot and had sound produced, you know, through vibrating the reed and playing it like a traditional saxophone, but also um, with its proximity to the mic. 
And how that happens is something we call feedback, right? Transducers uh, here, right on the bell, is taped on to a balloon, that, a cut balloon. So we took a balloon, cut it in half, wraps it around the bell of the soprano, tape the transducer onto it, and then you can see the speaker wire coming out of the transducer, going into this little preamp here. And then that, well, <laughs> if we start at the mic, which is the original receptacle, the sound goes into the mic, back to our little mixer here, out the headphone jack of this little Behringer into the preamp, sends the signal through the RCA over to our transducer. It makes noise with, within the room. It's feedbacking based on the size of the room. It's feedbacking based on its proximity to the inside of the saxophone as a resonating chamber. It creates this sound that then is picked up by the mic, cycled back through again and again. And that's how you get feedback to begin with, right? If your speaker source and your microphone source are in close proximity, they're just going to latch on to each other and continue to feed sound and receive sound at a rate that you know can, can get out of control. So one of the ways we control that is by changing the distance between the two, the mic and the transducer, so the sound source and the sound receptacle here. So, so during the piece, we can even demonstrate it might well. demonstrate? Yep. So I'm trying to find a spot where maybe it'll feed back a little differently. And I got a little bit of a high frequency pitch by putting it behind my back. So I'm standing, I'm using myself as a barrier between the mic and the transducer. And that, uh, that caused the, the sound to change a little bit. So um, in a way, I can affect the sound by moving it around. And um, in Popama, we like to think of these things as you know, sort of built into the piece, these theatrical things, but they aren't theater. They're not drama for the sake of drama. They are actual physical physical movements we're making to affect sound um, because it happens to add maybe to the you know, theater of the performance or make it more interesting is um, sort of secondary in our minds as a, in terms of priority. So um, throughout the piece, Dennis has different motions where I get close to the mic, where I back away from the mic, and then towards the very end, this large gesture over the course of many measures where I'm moving close There's a drama to that already. You've got this sort of this motion that it has all it's all built in potential energy and expectation as I get closer and closer and closer and you're hearing the sound change and change and build and get higher. Um, secretly Dennis is able to EQ this from the Behringer mic. So because it's going or the Behringer uh, a mixer, because it's going through um, this sound source that's over there, he can kind of control some of those you know, highs, lows, midi, uh, mid range kind of pitches we're getting from the feedback. And then also we've added uh, a second cycle, this fu fuzz probe, um, which is basically going out of the FX end and back feeding into its own channel within the Behringer. And what that does is it creates another layer of distortion for the feedback pitch. And that helps us to regulate just this blatant feedback if we want to um, have something that sort of cancels it out a little bit or makes a little nuance to the feedback sound. The fuzz probe can do that. Um, and uh, it you know, gives a little bit of range to something that you know, could get to be a little bit hard on the ears if used over an extended period of time. So that's the, the transducer idea. Yeah, and uh, you know, a couple, couple more thoughts on this. Uh, and, and Aaron brought up this idea of, you know, I always say, like, we have to, as cheesy as it sounds, we have to feedback responsibly. Um, it is such a um, volatile and possibly like ear splitting, damaging effect that we need to find a way to regulate. Um, and so one of the ways also to regulate, not only by putting the distortion pedal on it, but you can see that the distortion pedal here is going out and into the effects send and then into its own channel. We use the effects send of the mixer to send the distortion 
back to the mic. But you'll see I'll, I have also sent the effect send to the distortion channel, so I'm sending the distortion pedal signal back onto itself which if you were to just doing a pedal setup in a mixer, you would never want to do that because because you get feedback. Um, the pedal starts to create a feedback loop with itself. In this case, the feedback loop from this pedal with some adjustment will cancel out the damaging high pitched frequencies of the uh, of some of the feedback in the um, in the transducer. So um, also show you quickly um, We'll do this transducer one more time. This is also DD sixable, <laughs> meaning we can uh, we can. This is how we created uh, in in effect the end of the piece. And one last thing to show you here is there was one other feedback circuit which we don't have set up here today, but I've got a little cell phone video that I took from when I was extremely excited about it. Um, we have a transducer mounted on the back of a large thunder sheet, and that actually picks up the resonant frequencies of that thunder sheet that we can actually then bend that pitch by bending the uh, the thunder sheet itself. So we will show that quickly. hang out there for days. Um, so both of those are going through the same uh, mixer and essentially through the same channel. And so they all, we kind of have this three part um, loop and these things that kind of like the saxophone feedback is coming out of the trans, uh, the thunder sheet transducer and the thunder sheet transducer is coming out of the saxophone transducer and both are also spitting out the feedback loop from the distortion pedal. So everything kind of like interferes. So we kind of have to, when we play with that motion of the mic and we play with that motion of the saxophone, we're not only looking for interesting sounds within our own world, but we're finding out ways where we can cancel out and interfere with each other's sound. So it becomes kind of a, kind of a one-upping kind of game um, embedded in the piece. So that is uh, our under the head, under the hood look of Gamma Chamber. Um, really appreciate you being here today and we'll, um, we'll stick around here if you've got any questions. This video uh, that we played today will be up on our YouTube channel shortly and we'll just live there uh, along with uh, Aaron's video of Light on Light that you saw the other day and many of the videos from the concert if you want to take a second look. Wow, that was uh, an absolutely um, inspiring and incredible talk. And demonstration. Um, there are definitely a few questions we're going to go through, but um, first off, I just wanted to say I was so um, impressed and in awe of this uh, incredibly complicated, nuanced network made of all these complex sounds and simple devices that to me really felt like it's amplifying the nowness you were talking about yesterday. All of the actions are just like have huge consequence, but you've tuned the whole system where it stays in a world that you can still kind of compose and predict. So that was, yeah, I'm glad really impressive. Uh, yeah. For your process of wrangling, <laughs> wrangling all those pieces and parts. <laughs> um, well, that actually brings up one of the, it was more a comment um, from Flannery Cunningham um, early on in the chat I wanted to bring up was, um, she mentioned that uh, it was great to hear such an honest account of rethinking and revision a work like this. And I wondered if you could um, briefly touch on this. Um, clearly, the, the work has had such an evolution, but also I'm sure it took an incredible amount of workshopping um, together and uh, on your own. But then also, um, how do you prepare that for different spaces and um, perhaps different percussion instruments. Um, I know if you're on the road, you may not always have the same instruments. So, so I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Sure. Um, 
The percussion instruments luckily don't create too much of a of an issue um i guess if it, it would be a bummer if they were too small <laughs> <laughs> as long as it's a big tam tam and a big bass drum um and then you know a snare drum's a snare drum it's upside down on that in that piece anyway <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, the percussion instruments not so much but um the setup and it, it, it's not even as i mean the, the feedback transducers are, of course very responsive to the room um the rest of the electronics it's just kind of I don't want to say the rest of them are kind of plug and play. I guess they're plug and play after a lot of like a uh, whole, whole like Google Doc full of the levels um, that seem to work best. Um, and then micro adjusting that. It's really just uh, the setup time. I mean, we've done it when mm-hmm. we in New York, we set it up uh, and tape everything down to the table and slide the table into the bed of the truck and just like everything's there. That's it, great. Everything is like coiled and and completely packed um it's a day you know so we're yeah. so we have to unfortunately be kind of selective about when we program that and aaron has also a piece of wormhole um that was also up on the youtube channel worth checking out um that was we premiered with uh gamma chamber at splice years ago that those are our those are our full day <laughs> check pieces yeah. Yeah, it's worth mentioning. I mean, this piece was originally premiered at Splice years ago at Western Michigan, and um, and it was the different piece, the earlier piece that Dennis had mentioned, where you know there was the Malik Cat, and, and all of these electronic sounds were triggered um, in some way. And I know in the early days, um, I was playing like a whammy pedal, and it was it was difficult to play the whammy pedal because I was also trying to turn my pages because we were working off of score, and it was just like we were we were struggling a little bit with limbs, and 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 also. <laughs> I mean, at the, at the point in which Dennis decided to add the tape part, um, we also often have this discussion about, you know, what is that threshold to the point where you, you are going to put yourself on click track as, or, or will be on click track as a performer with a tape part. And in a lot of cases, it's, um, I, I fall on the side of no click track. I really prefer no click track um, only because as a performer, it is somewhat, um, it's somewhat restrictive. Uh, however, with this piece, the just the amount of, things that were going on uh the fact that it was meant to be performed in the dark so after those things you might not see or you know experience as an audience member anyway and uh and the idea that already with the you know transducer i'm i I mean as a performer i pretty much get to dance up here um through finding sounds like i it's not i'm not dancing to dance it's actually dancing to play the piece um being on that click track wasn't as restrictive um to the piece overall in fact it helps so we so i mean when dennis made that decision to put it on tape actually we're we're pretty pleased great great all right we got another question from uh seth rosanoff uh based on the way you set up your composition uh do you find any unexpected happenings each time it's performed well i think uh actually it was in the recording um i think w- one of the transducers started on fire uh, which these things are cheap and they get, <laughs> and we've been running the same transducer for a number of takes. And at some point in the, in the performance, I thought, man, do you smell that? And then sure enough, I was like, oh no. I mean, I, I, I have no problem, um, like taping things and, and doing all sorts of, you know, of, of questionable things to the saxophone, um, in terms of just like, a, you know, adding elements and for the sake of the music. But when it started on fire, I actually got a little bit nervous. Uh, yes, I said, we've, we found we found the line of of what Aaron is willing to put her horn through, and that line is fire. Um, <laughs> and that was that that was actually the take we wound up using um, because it made this amazing sound as it just kind of you heard this crackle, crackle, crackle. Um, the piece in every other performance had ended in a, like that fade out uh, was very different than the way we usually end it. We usually kind of build it to this huge, we layer the the transducer right on the mic over itself over and over and over again until it becomes this kind of like swarming buzzing beehive thing. And we've done that again since the recording. But for this one, um, we just were so into the machine, the system being put through its paces and then ultimately completely giving out that we're just like, I think that's the document that's going to be, we're going to stick with it and we'll just fade it out at the end. <laughs> yeah, well, that take was definitely fire. So that was great. Um, I had to. Uh, anyway, uh, we got another one. Um, this is interesting. Um, 
From Connor uh, Scroggins, what are the most challenging sonic qualities for you to connect between acoustic and electronic sounds? Whoa. Oh. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, rhythmic engagement hmm. is certainly one thing. Um, and that's where you wind up with having kind of the question of click. Um, if you needed to like have some fast, like tight hocketing between a machine and yourself, um, where the machine might be perfect and you might, and you're certainly not. Um, so I think finding like meaningful rhythmic engagement with machines, um, is something that I still am in search of a little bit more. And may maybe that's because I'm coming from a percussion standpoint but I'm, I've, I've yet to feel like really satisfied um it's like either a tape and i know it's coming and it's not as exciting or you know just trying to find you know and i guess when i say with electronics i'm talking about like rhythmic engagement with a with a system or a machine that has its own agency um not necessarily something that somebody is is playing like pads or, or something like that um yeah man that's a that's a really deep question that i kind of want to think more about and maybe connor will we'll talk about that uh, we'll <laughs> get, hit the email yeah i would say for from a saxophone standpoint um it's uh it's difficult to play with raw just raw basic electronic sounds like modulus and sign tone production um to an acoustic instrument like the saxophone that's probably been the, the most difficult um entryway i've had uh it, I, i've tried on a number of occasions to find you know, just ways to match timbrely and it's it's such a different world at its outset that if i have mm. a you know a, if i've got a pedal board with a lot of effects i can always find a way in and if i've got um and if there's um if if there's distortion to the waveform or something else happening there i can always find blend but just pure pure bloop, 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 sign tones are some of the hardest things to actually connect acoustically um mm -hmm. on a more general level not that doesn't happen in gamma but for to connor's question yeah, I, um, that made me also realize uh, while maybe there's not always like acoustic or sonic connection between whatever um, acoustic sounds are making and electronic sounds, but the um, uh, impact and effect you have on the feedback network through your movement in place of that, I think somehow brings like the proximity of your playing into the system in a really um, uh, overt way that's easy to perceive and track, um, which is really cool. Um, all right, I think we got time for one more um, from Be uh, Brett Masteller. Uh, do you find that computer, if involved, computer interaction works best in one way or multiple ways for things like live sampling, uh, signal processing, triggering, um, or pitch tracking, or um, time-based events? Um, or as you mentioned, performer triggering uh, event advancing. So do you like the computer to have a system to make decisions or do you like to have a bit more control um, over the computer if you're using one? Um, I think it depends on the system. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I guess it's like nice when the system models some an agency that feels somewhat in a human wheelhouse um maybe i don't know but not that's not to say that i'm then not really excited and surprised by something that's just like completely you know algorithmically beyond my brain's computing power to, to comprehend which way it, which direction it's going to turn um yeah i think with computer i mean we don't actually use computers and manipulate computers and performance very much i mean it's a, it, it, partially because it's not you know a visible instrument to the audience i mean there's a um, there's, you know, the cover of a laptop you can't see unless we have an overhead camera. Um, and also because, you know, typically we need this, a certain radius of space in order to mm -hmm. operate. So we look for devices, we look for controllers. Um, yesterday, uh, or two days ago when we talked about Showdown, having the, uh, having the Max patch um, for the joystick controllers was a really great way. Um, but we were, we do, when we play that piece, run two computers, separate computers mm -hmm. with separate Max patches. And part of that is also, I mean, getting nervous when there's more than one piece of software running on the computer. I didn't Absolutely. Yeah. Which you all know from Splice. So um, 
finding ways if there is software, we get a lot of Mac software to find controllers to, um, if we do need to manipulate software is probably our first instinct. And I will say like with Showdown, we make the conscious decision to black out the screen of the laptop and close it as far as we can get it and stow it away under the table. And that's not to like shy away from, we, it's not that we're just like, oh, we don't want anybody to know that we, we've got laptops on stage, but we we do kind of love this idea of just like having this like, you know, old cruddy Logitech joystick sitting out there and then it just does all these things and you interact with it. And it's just like, we do kind of like the idea that like the sounds are coming out of that tactile device as opposed to there being like a visible sound engine behind it that's feeding mm -hmm. command. So we love computers and laptops and we use, we use them, but we, I, I, yeah, I'll admit that we tend to kind of like stow them away and have it be on the focus, be on the controller and be on the action. Definitely. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, well, I think we're out of time. So I'd just like to uh, thank Pope Obama, Aaron Rodgers, and Dennis Sullivan for this presentation and everything you've been doing this week as part of the featured guest ensemble at um, our Splice Institute. And I would like to uh, let everyone know we have another concert tonight at 7.30 Eastern PM that will feature um, Splice Ensemble, um, some works by Per Boland, El Elsa Justel, uh, Alex Christie and um, Adam Bedixis and uh, and some world premiere videos on it. So it should be a great show. And uh, thanks again to Pope Obama. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Sam. Thanks everyone for tuning in. <laughs>